So hi, hello, and welcome. Hopefully everybody's enjoying Unreal Fest so far. I want to thank everybody that's joining us on the live stream today. This panel is being recorded and will be posted to the Unreal Engine YouTube channel after the event. So for some quick intros, my name is Jessica Archer, and I am part of the business development side of Unreal Engine for games. And today it is my immense honor to be up on stage here with uh, some of the team from Crystal Dynamics. Um, and they're gonna be sharing with us about um, their move from a couple of decades in internal tech over to UE5, which was no small feat. Um, we're gonna kick off the discussion with a few questions that I have for them first because someone gave me a microphone and now I'm up here unsupervised. So uh, after that, we will open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, and most importantly, Crystal is here today to talk about the tech. Um, they will not be answering any questions about current or future projects. So when it's time for questions from you, if you could be respectful of that and keep the conversation related to their experience moving to a new engine, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, so if we could give them a nice warm welcome, we will then move into their introductions and start the discussion. All right, so. I guess I'll go first. I'm uh, Scott Stevens. I'm a tech director at Crystal. I've been there for two years now. And uh, I actually came as an outsider for this because as a newcomer, uh, I've been in Unreal at other studios uh, for about five or six years. So I was uh, kind of a third party observer to the process of the switch and uh, hopefully I was of some help. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Alicia Thayer. I am a lead technical designer at Crystal. I've been here for about 10 years. Um, and I'll be representing content creation, uh, prototyping, technical design. Hi all, I'm Till Brenner. I'm one of the technical directors as well. I've been at Crystal for almost 13 years now, and you'll be hearing a lot about the technical side, our decision-making process, and the pain points that we went through. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alyssa Reuter. I'm technical art director here at Crystal. Been here for about eight years now, and I'll be representing uh, tech arts, tools and pipelines, our materials, and also maybe a little bit about our environment team. Awesome. Uh, I'm Ben Irving, uh, executive producer here at Crystal. Uh, I've been at Crystal for about two and a half years, so similar to Scott, kind of a newer addition to the team, had worked at studios on, Re on Unreal before as well, and joined right around the time we started talking about, hey, what if we move from our proprietary tech over to the Unreal Engine? Um, so I can talk a bit more to the, the kind of strategic conversations we had or some of the production realities, if you'll have questions about that. Back Great. to you, Jess. Thank you. So we'll start off with the big question that everyone has, and that is, why did you switch from internal tech to UE5? Yeah, so I mean, it's an obvious starting point, and I'll give a little bit of context, and then we can hand over to the team to kind of dive into some of the, the specifics that I'm sure is what you're all after. But you know, in Crystal's history, uh, we actually had talked about moving to Unreal several times and decided to not do it. Uh, we decided to, to invest in our own tech and, and build up our engine. And so then the question becomes, well, what changed? What was different this time around? Um, and I think a lot of that answer is just the difference in the industry. You know, the, the further time goes on, the more technical games are, the bigger games are, the more complicated it is, um, as well as the, like, the quality standards we put on ourselves for the games that we want to deliver continue to go up. And so we quickly got to the point of saying, you know, do we want to be a game team that builds engines or do we want a game team that builds games? Uh, and we kind of sided with the passion for us, which is the game making, telling amazing stories in, in immersive worlds. That's the thing that we're really passionate about. And some of the production reality there was, and I'll use made up numbers just for the, the sake of it, you know, do you put 50 engineers on creating an engine or do you take those 50 people and put the energy on creating the game? And ultimately for us, we wanted to put those people on making the game, and we felt like over time, we wouldn't be able to keep up with other engines in the market, like Unreal. Um, we did a, a long evaluation, and again, I'll, I'll hand off here in a second to talk about some of those details. Um, 
But none of that was easy. There was lots of, it wasn't all a slam dunk. For example, Till and Scott will speak a bit to some of the engineering challenges. On the tech side, a lot of it we felt would be, there were pros and cons and we weren't sure. Whereas on the content creation side, design, art, et cetera, we felt like it was a slam dunk with the, the tools that Unreal has. And, and again, that's where the, the other team members can talk to that. And so it wasn't a slam dunk. I think we're all happy to have gone through it, but it certainly wasn't easy. And so if you're in that spot, you know, they're the kinds of questions we're happy to answer. We want to be super candid in the conversation. Uh, we want to share the positive things that have worked well for us, as well as the things that we're finding challenging. Um, Jess has encouraged us, even though she's from Epic, uh, to be as honest and candid as possible. And so we'd love to hear uh, tough questions as well as, as easy questions from you all. But why don't I hand off and, and we'll go to Till first to talk a little bit about, you know, the engineering challenges or, or discussions we had in the evaluation. Sure thing. So one of the big things is the history of, of Crystal and how many years we've actually spent and invested in, in our proprietary engine called Foundation. Um, at least 20 years, if I remember correctly. Um, as I said, I've been there for 13 years. In those 13 years, we actually did two rewrites of the engine where we added major architectural changes. Uh, during one of them, we actually did do an evaluation of Unreal as well. Um, and specifically, we were looking at Kismet at that time. And one of our scripting, visual scripting languages ended up being very, very similar to that concept. And we called it a action graph at this point, not to be confused with action script, but action graph. Um, so that's the, the 13 years there. We added a lot of tech. I personally spent a lot of time actually in the code writing new systems, and it is, I had to give up my baby on this one. So this, this was definitely one of those, uh, me as the engineer on this panel, I, I struggled a lot with, with this particular decision. Uh, so I'll hand it off to somebody else. Yeah, I don't know, Scott, you want to add just the flavor of being the, the engineer with Unreal experience coming into the team full of uh, proprietary engine experience and like some of those conversations you had to have with the team. Yeah, that, there was a lot of uh, sort of reassuring that they would still have a job, that there's still plenty of engineering to be done even when you're using Unreal, that, that there's no uh, lack of technical work still, still to be done. Um, there, uh, it's also takes a little bit of a mind mind shift change that um, you know when you're in an engineer on Unreal, you might spend as much time researching the problem and seeing how how it's done elsewhere in the engine as as, as you will just implementing something because you know you want to know if it's already there first, already there implemented in the engine. From a content creator's perspective, um, we ended up looking at a lot. I mean, I do a lot of like rapid prototyping and early gameplay exploration, in addition to you know supporting the designers with tools and things like that. So I I felt like a kid in the candy store candy store when we were doing our evaluation and deciding whether or not to to change. Um, I, having Blueprint available to me in UMG, I'm being able to make editor tools and runtime tools um, without needing to interface with code. Um, these were things that we didn't have accessible to us in our previous engine. Um, in addition, Sequencer. Um, uh, Till said we evaluated Unreal, what, three for matinee back in the day, right? Like, basically from that point on, the design team uh, and the content creators were begging for something like matinee, you know? So Sequencer, like, uh, yeah, it was just, it was, was kind of like, hey, finally, you know? Um, and so we spent some time figuring out, like, the, the applications, whether it be cinematic or in gameplay for Sequencer, and, you know, basically every time we opened up a, a, new, a new tool, we just found infinite uses for it. So, Yeah, and I think another thing, like, from a tech art perspective, even though we're doing a lot of tools and pipelines where we're not directly involved in the engine, like, we do do a lot of content creator support. Um, and looking at Unreal, um, like, it offers some really polished, like, UX, like, right out of the box, which was really helpful because... Um, Artists could either like just figure it out intuitively. There's tons of documentation that they can refer to. Um, and a lot of content creators also learn how to use Unreal in school. Um, so that translates to a little bit less support time for tech art. Um, and we can spend more time working on really cool things. So that was really nice. There is an, an additional element, and this actually pains me as an engineer to say, you know, I, I actually completely agree with our content creators that 
um, Unreal really makes it easy for people to actually work with those tools. Uh, in, in our pro uh, prior engine, people were struggling. It was a really powerful engine, but you had to have a PhD, for instance, in our physics. Okay, system, yeah, right? it was it was it was crazy powerful, but it was nuanced, right? Like, I mean, Till said it's like what, like 20 years old or something like that, right? So it's building on it since like. Gex, you know, like forever ago, um, and it, 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 we found that it would there, the ramp time to get someone familiar with our tools it took a while, right? And the physics engine one, it, he brings that up because I I bring it up a lot, right? Like it had real world world values in it, right? And so if you didn't have a lot of experience in physics, for example, like you may not be able to intuit that a tunable needs to be point zero 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 one, for example, or something like that, right? So um, yeah, the everything's very visual in, in Unreal. The whole blueprint is everything concept I'm a big fan of. It just means that you, you know I can learn one thing in one place and then apply it to everything else, and that's been very great. And then speaking of, of the history there, speaking of Gex specifically, we had a unit. Our, our entire worlds were built with Gexels. And then one of those big reworks was actually purging Gexels out of the engine. And with Unreal, we just have centimeters and meters, and it's just a standard unit, so. It's, it's the little things, yeah. Yeah, that was actually another thing that we uh, struggled with a little bit in foundation, um, just because we've been going project to project. Um, we've accumulated a lot in the engine, and at one point we tried to separate our content from our engine code, and that ended up being really difficult, actually. Um, it was basically hard-coded in. Um, so we ended up with a lot of old stuff in our newer games. Not ideal. So we're going to keep moving because I know, I know it's easy to keep talking. Sorry, really but um, one other, another question that I had was, um, how long did it take you to get up to speed for your teams? Shall I give a, a so we did some high level stuff and then I think if you'll speak to the specific thing. So, um, one of the things we did, and, and I don't know, there, there might be better ways to do it, but our approach was, uh, let's take a six month initiative where we try to build something that's a playable experience and we use that as what we called Unreal Learning or Unreal Training, I forget, whatever we called it, one of those two things. Um, and the whole goal was like, this was a, an added part of the cycle of our project. It wasn't about hitting project specific goals, but it was about teaching the team. Um, and we started early on just with doing things like, oh, we'll just do the online learning courses and whatever. But, but we found that without trying to rally the team around a deliverable, we weren't like forcing groups to come together to build something playable, to learn a bunch of the harder lessons you don't learn until you're trying to actually do that. And so um, that was a thing that I think worked well for us. We had a playable thing at the end. It was themed to the kinds of games we're interested in building, as you can imagine, um, but it wasn't specific to the, the game we were trying to make at the time, um, but it helped rally the team into that. And and one point I want to make before we, we hand off is like, we didn't think that we would become Unreal experts in six months. We just felt like that was about the amount of time our team needed to experiment, to learn, before we could go back to, to building the game. And I think it's probably fair to say everyone's still learning now, even though we're, we're pretty deep into it and we'll probably keep learning forever. I don't think you, you master it all necessarily, but that was just a dedicated, at least from like a production or team perspective, a dedicated amount of time we had to to give our team some space to learn and adjust to a brand new engine. So, so. how's it going with the design and scripting though? So Alicia. I can do that one. Uh, yeah, so the design and scripting is interesting. Like I, I have to talk a little bit about our old, we had a visual scripting language before, right? Blueprint is familiar. It's not a huge uh, jump to go from one to the other. However, the readability of our old scripting language was um, a, a little less than Blueprint. That The execution pin concept, right? We didn't have that. So any output could trigger any input, which meant that you ended up with a lot of loop de -de 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 scripts. Um, but, it was, for, it was further abstracted um, from C++ than Blueprint is. And I think that it was more accessible to our designers and our content creators than Blueprint is. And so I am noticing on my team that for the less technical scripters, um, they are struggling a little bit with adopting Blueprint. It's a little scary for them, right? Um, and they're needing more, more help and more time and, and, and more tutelage. And Blueprint is definitely a lot closer to code than, than our previous uh, visual scripting language. Uh, think of it as, Lego pieces, you have a lot more Lego pieces, whereas on, on our previous engine, we had pre-assembled Lego constructs that we could then uh, assemble to, to, to be bigger pieces. Um, however, <laughs> 
again, as an engineer, I actually really like how close Blueprint is to code. And it is so easy to actually implement new nodes, new functionality, just by adding a certain type of uh, macro or, or uh, markup to, to the actual code. Whereas on foundation, it was actually a thing. You had to write your own classes, and that would actually expose the functionality and then test it and all that kind of stuff. It is so much easier to do that in Unreal. That's a really good segue into something I wanted to make sure that we covered on this talk, and that was, um, so in our previous in our previous engine, um, we had a, a pretty big wall between uh, content creators and engineers. And with Blueprint being adjacent, more adjacent to C++, I'm finding that my relationship with, with my engineers is improving greatly. Um, and I have one in particular that I work very closely with. And the way she and I work together is we set up kind of the, the code backbone for anything that we're working on. We extend Blueprints from that, just like Epic recommends, right? Um, but what it lets me do is it lets me, it gets me little noodle places, right, to, to prototype in Blueprint and to play with new features. And then when I feel like it's, it's what I want and I can represent what I want, I go back to her and say, hey, check this out. I think I, I think this is how we want to build this content. We'll review it together. And then she ports that to code, right? And we just do that at regular intervals. And it's, it is, it's beautiful, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, it's pretty much one of the best ways I've ever worked with engineers in my life, like in my career. I guess those are the first two hot tips right there. Right. <laughs> Number one, set up your base class first, inherit uh, your blueprint off of that, because that makes it so much easier than to actually transfer everything over to code. Uh, the other hot tip, if you haven't looked at it, redirectors, core redirectors, that's a really, really important uh, concept. Look into it. Was there, was there much of a difference um, switching over to Unreal with like junior versus senior team members? That's actually a really good point. Thank you. Um, I noticed actually a really interesting correlation of seniority and how easy it was for people to switch over. The more junior engineers, especially in the engineers, they had a lot more experience either from school or it was just a lot more, they were a lot more comfortable in the switch. Our senior engineers, they actually struggled, myself included. We just struggled a little bit more trying to adapt to the new uh, concepts that Unreal brought them. But to be fair, like a lot of these people are fighting with like a decade of experience or a decade plus experience in a different engine, right? And our old engine, you know, like it was extremely powerful, but it does approach problems differently than Unreal does. And so the rewiring is really tough. <laughs> As I said, 12 years on an engine, I had to give up my baby there. Cool. So any anything else on that topic before we move? Actually, probably a good topic here to cover then is how did we even, you actually said the, the, the six months worth of a training phase then, right? But we actually did have a phase even before that where we started evaluating the engine. And it was actually uh, three months for the larger team and at least another two months uh, before that where a really small core set of engineers and content creators were actually looking at, uh, yeah, I think that's at right. Unreal. Then. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that we decided to do that, we actually listed over 90 topics, uh, stack ranked them, actually weighted them uh, to figure out, let's, let's look at this from an engineering perspective. What are the pros? What are the cons? Uh, some of the early, early or the, the highly stack ranked items were definitely our streaming system, mm -hmm. but I think the top one was the multi-user workflow. Oh, certainly, yeah. And I think that's a perfect set. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the, the pre-evaluation, right, was, was a little targeted effort of just a, a handful of experts um, all dog, dogpiling on a little, a little, a little effort, a little um, uh, project to see, just to test the waters with multi-user workflow. We were really afraid of that. Our old engine was really good at it. All of our, um, our assets were XML. Right, so our developers got really accustomed to be able to check something out, right? Keep it checked out for long periods of time, um, and then just kind of most of the time, most of the time, merge it pretty seamlessly with someone else's work, right? Um, I see some people chuckling. Yeah, it's because I say most of the time we did have some experts in house, right, who would help, you know, when things just totally blew up, you know. Um, but the cool thing about having those be text based is we were able to like jump in and open them up in a text editor, and they're like, oh, okay, this is what went wrong, you know, and and then fix them by hand. Um, so we were really worried about exclusive checkout, right, um, with a team culture that just does not jive with that, you know, and then not being able to merge. Um, I will admit that on 
in that eval period, it was tough. Like we did stomp on each other a lot, but we learned that what that taught us really early was the value in in our in architecting our content correctly, right? And uh, compartmentalizing things, making things components, things like that, right? Um, so it was it was a very good teaching experience. But we did like that was a really valuable um, exercise for us because it started to challenge the assumptions that we had been using for a long, long time. That's a, that's a great transition and start to the next question, um, which is, you know, what can UE5 do that your engine could not and vice versa? Do you want to go first, Scott? Uh, sure. I hope I'm taking one's thunder here, but uh, one of the bigger ones was animation previewing and being able to, uh, you know, tweak an animation and just view it right there. I think they had to go end to end to the target platform to see the actual tweak uh, so that, I mean, all those workflows like that were, were uh, you know, definitely advantages that Unreal, Unreal had. Uh, a sequencer, obviously, we already mentioned that one. Uh, There's also a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, the VFX system was another one. Um, I would actually argue Blueprint is one of those in terms of how close it is to code, right? Uh, but... Yeah, <laughs> a whole bunch of really cool tech. So um, let's see, we got Nanite, we got Lumen, like Till mentioned, the VFX system, we got virtual textures. Um, it's easy to add plugins, which you can talk about. Um, virtual shadow maps, like so many cool things right out of the box. Um, so that was really awesome to take a step forward um, just by switching. Validation. Oh, 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 validation and automation. There you Thank go. You. No, I absolutely adore the, the the automated system and the automation system. We just didn't have any of that on foundation. We tried a couple of times to, to build something like that. It just didn't work, but it just comes out of the box. Um, there is a lot of work that goes into writing proper validation and writing proper uh, automated systems, but the fact that the foundation is at home, foundation is there, uh, makes it just so much easier and so much uh, nicer to work with Unreal on that. One thing I will say about the validation stuff too, because I've come to appreciate it even as a content creator. Um, getting we got it set up really early, and we, like we decided to just kind of go all in. We were just gonna like, okay, let's let's do this, right? It's the greatest teaching tool. Right, like our content creators are just naturally messaged when they mess something up, right? When they don't set up an asset, right, or something like that. And it makes what it creates is a self-documenting tool, which is the best thing ever because we all know you can, you know, pour your heart out into Confluence, right? But like, if if people don't know that those those things are there, then you know uh, your your team isn't learning. So the from a content creator's perspective, the validation. I mean, I get hit by the validator all the time, right? Um, but it's great because it reminds me that like I'm creating problems for myself in the future, and I should fix those before I check them in. I mean, for sure, there's also just console support, and there's a, a whole bunch of work that we can now leave in Epic's hands to just take care of all the nuances of each platform. We know if it works, you know, on PC, it's probably going to work plus or minus a little bit of, of tweaking on, on other platforms. That was uh, one of the advantages for sure. So what about some of the things that you miss now from Foundation or that you're frustrated by with moving to Unreal? Um, so for me personally, I do kind of miss our material system that we had in Foundation. It was very, very powerful, but like we mentioned earlier, um, even though it was very powerful, it was sometimes a little hard to use. Um, so I do miss that, I guess, the two things specifically are, I think we had a little bit more control over um, the user-facing UI UX for our materials. Um, so we could organize things um, in a way that our artists really liked. Uh, the other thing is um, the amount of um, modifications we were able to make as technical artists. Like we could do a lot of things. Um, that we don't have access to um, in Unreal without making source code as it, edits, um, which we want to be really careful about. Um, so I do miss that a little bit, um, but there are other aspects of the material system that are great, so. On, on the gameplay side, there's, you know, I think we kind of underestimated the amount that, uh, that Epic leaves up, up to the team to decide about things like, there's no class weapon, there's a very basic projectile, there's some very basic damage systems, but in terms of the kind of games Crystal tends to make, there's a lot of infrastructure that was built around those games in the old engine that we're you know, having to recreate 
And it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's appropriate that the engine leaves all those things up to you to decide, but as part of the switch, there's, there's a lot of work in front of us in that, in that space. On the flip side, it does allow us to actually get rid of some of that cruft then as well. So for instance, our old inventory system, we rewrote that a nice reset know, how many button. times. Yeah, yeah. But that's a great reset button. Um, one of the things that I actually really miss was our, or is, was, was our streaming system. Uh, the, the streaming system on the foundation engine was really, really powerful. Um, we were actually looking for equivalent workflows. Uh, so we had something called stream layers. They actually had built in logic in terms of when they would actually stream in, when they would stream out. Um, and then with UE5, we actually got our data layers in as well, right? And that is one of those really great one for one, almost one for one um, systems that, that really help us maintain the workflow and the, and the way we were thinking about our games. So, Alicia, I, I know you love blueprints so very much, but is there is there anything that they're not not all the way there for for you? I love everything about it. Performance. <laughs> I haven't had hit, okay, yeah, that performance I'm sure is an issue, which we'll get to, but um, I, I, it's the, the accessibility is, is the thing I'm struggling the most with, right? Um, like, I am, I am feeling on my team a need for, like, a layer of technical designers that sit, you know, in between the engineers and the, you know, the, the level designers and the, and the, the content creators, um, just because a lot of them, like I was saying before, like, they... The, there's a little bit of history here. Um, like we, when we switched, like we really wanted to try to do things the unreal way, the right way. And so that was the message to the team was like, you know, do your research, take your time, try to figure out the right way to do things. But the weird flip side, the weird effect of that is, is that, you know, you combine that with the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of the tools, right? And you kind of get paralysis. And so like I was saying earlier with our less technical um, scripters, they, I find that a lot of them just kind of freeze up a little bit and go like, I'm not sure what the right thing is to do. Um, which is motivating me to try to make more helper, you know, like helper function libraries and, or, you know, our little macros for them or even tutorial videos, things like that to ease that along. But that, it has not, that has not been as easy and it's kind of fire and forget as our action graph visual scripting language was. So I'll do a quick plug for support here. When your team members don't know what the right Unreal path is, what do you have them do now? There's actually a couple of steps. One, Talk to your Unreal experts if you have them on the team. It is so valuable. Ask often, ask frequently. And then on top of that, obviously rely on Epic. Post on UDN, post often, post frequently. Get those questions out, uh, out there so that we can actually look at those answers and then implement it the right way. Yeah, and, and UDN is for everyone. It doesn't need to be something that, you know, you hold off and only a few of the senior team members have access to. Like, add, add the whole teams, right? Because everyone's going to have questions. 